Um, Debbie Seeger is a senior vice president and co-founder of the Patina Solutions and also leads the company's Milwaukee and Madison offices. She has spent her 32 years career working with companies on strategic performance and workforce solutions, pioneering new programs and solutions through her career for companies ranging from startup and early stage phases to mature Fortune 500 companies. And because of her work, uh, throughout her career and her involvement in the community, she has earned the designation of Woman of Influence by the Milwaukee Business Journal in 2015. Prior to her involvement in Patina Solutions, uh, Debbie was a key member of the Jefferson Wells Wisconsin Group Management Team, and while there she was responsible for sales, marketing, and client relationship management, consistently achieving top-level sales honors and awards for her performance. And prior to Jefferson Wells, Debbie was a managing partner for Tailored Management Incorporated and also spent 13 years with Manpower where she was responsible for sales, operations, and profitability uh, performance of operations in St. Louis and Milwaukee. And while at Manpower, she conceived of and piloted a new business model that changed the way companies provided staffing services to clients, earning her the uh, Pericles Award for the Employment Management Association. She holds a BA degree in communications from the University of Wisconsin. Debbie, welcome. We're glad you're here. Thank you so much. Man, the energy in this room is really great. I appreciate that um, because that's all part of what makes learning fun, right? Um, and so I love the Rotary groups. I'm not a member of Rotary. Um, the last time I went to a Rotary meeting, the first time I went to one, I remember saying to my guest, I, I just kind of held up the like number four and he leaned over and said four what i said number of people who are sleeping right now <laughs> um, and so it's been a long time and what a great you know job you guys have done to just be more broad and more diverse um what a great group of people this looks like um i you know there's two kind of speakers those who say they get nervous and those who are liars right um, and so thank god i have a podium here you can't see my knees shaking I get a little nervous. Um, you know what's the worst time to be a speaker? Right after, right after lunch. lunch. Okay, so help me out here. For those of you who can, um, if you would just, I'm going to count to three on, on three. If you just stand up, think of something you're really joyful about and give a little shout, okay? Just stand up if you can. Give a little shout. One, two, three. Stand up. Okay. Right. <laughs> All right, okay. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, can you feel it? Can you feel like the energy now is flowing? You're ready to learn. And I'm going to go home and tell my husband I had a standing ovation before I even said anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> the other thing I think I like about this group of people that this is the center of the universe here in Madison, isn't it? You, you guys are so smart. What's it like to know everything? Right? <laughs> it's hard. It is. So I'm not going to try to teach you anything you don't know. We're going to think differently. We're just going to think differently about what's going on. And I'm not here to tell you anything you don't already know. We're just going to think about it differently. If you thought I was going to be up here giving you all the answers, well, you could leave now. And that's okay, really, because um, you know everything. But we'll, we'll challenge ourselves to kind of think about things differently. And at the end, I'm going to save the best for last. So if you think you're sneaking out early, I'm telling you right now, you're going to miss the best part of it. Um, so we're going to ask ourselves all to be a little bit of a, there it is, a futurist today and think about the future. Um, I call this shift happens. You say that very carefully, right? <laughs> because it does. And to understand what's going on and the foundation of it, um, to me, is to understand the foundation will help us all be our own kind of futurists and project out then what this means and extrapolate this out. And so the first futurist, this is hard for some of you to see, so I'll read it. Uh, you know, man, what a smart guy was Albert Einstein, wasn't he? This is what he said. I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. <laughs> The day that technology will surpass our human interaction. I'm afraid of that day. And I start getting more afraid every day when my daughter sends me a text and I'm in the kitchen and she's in her bedroom. <laughs> that, that seems like a sad day, right? Um, I just read something about the end of an era and they were talking about the telephone call. 
that it's possible that this greatest invention, one of the best inventions ever in the history of mankind, might be reaching the end of an era. And so I thought, well, what's going to happen in bars when you meet some, you know, we met some guy and you're like, okay, call me, all right? You know, this doesn't mean anything anymore. <laughs> so now they, people, they talk on their phones and they hold it like it's a slice of pizza, right? And they talk on it like this. And so what are you going to do? What are you going to be in a bar and go, okay, call me, okay? <laughs> Things are changing and they're changing so fast that the rate of technology and the speed has surpassed some people's capacity to absorb it. And I'm not making fun of this, it's true. I saw the interview some time ago with the, uh, the oldest living slave in our country, this woman, who was 100 years old. This was an interview sometime in the 1970s. And uh, what, I, what I heard her talk about was that in her lifetime, she went from the technology changes of the mode of transportation as a young girl was walking barefoot. And then, you know, they advanced to horse travel, then they advanced to horse and buggy, and then car and carriage, and then automobiles, and then uh, airplanes. And she lived through the 1960s and was able to see the moon landing, but she couldn't believe it because it was too much change in her lifetime for her to absorb the capacity to conceive it for her. And so I think that I, I, about that woman and, and what she all saw in her lifetime and what we're seeing in such a short period of time. When I think about my husband in the 1980s who went to the MCI World Conference in Atlanta, remember MCI? And he came home and he goes, Deb, you're not gonna believe it. There, someday you're gonna be able to talk on your phone wherever you are. Like without that cord on the wall, you're going to be able to walk around and talk on the phone. I was like, oh my God, that's going to be awesome. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And not only that, you're going to be able to take a picture and send it to somebody else. And they're going to be able to see what you're seeing. So that, you know, every time you go to the um, antique auction, if you see something that you think I'm going to like, you could send me a picture before you buy it, right? <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, that doesn't seem like it's that long ago, doesn't it? All right, you want to talk about technology and the oh my God of here what's coming? Let's think about the kids right now. This is a letter to Santa. You know what that is right there? That's the URL code for what he wants for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> These kids. They're, you know, they're growing up, these little monsters, and they're going to be in your workforce. And I'm going to ask you to think about what that means. They know what they want. They're precise about it. They're telling Santa exactly where to find it. Make no mistake. This is the URL code for it, right? My kids, what I fear about them, those little stinkers, is we, we grew up in a neighborhood. We had the first microwave on the block. And I remember the neighbors coming down and watch us pop popcorn in the microwave and, and bake bacon, you know, that was like a show. And my, my son then, when he was about 10 years old, he was standing in front of the microwave going, hurry up. And I thought, holy, you know what? What's going to happen in the workforce when we have a bunch of kids for whom the microwave is not fast enough? That's pretty darn scary, isn't it? So uh, some time ago, at early in my career, I had the pleasure of working with Manpower. It was the, the country's largest non-government employer at the time. A lot of people had temp staff service capability as a gateway to work, and, and it, was a, it was a learning time in my life, a grateful period in my life. Um, but this is a, a chart of US birth records, and why I have this on here is because if the world runs on the economy, uh, the economic model of supply and demand, we ought to at first take a look at what is the potential of the demand? And that's in people, right? And so this is the number of people by birth record. On the far right are the group of people that are, for some of us, our parents leaving the workforce, you know, upwards of septuagenarians. On the far left are the younger folks coming into the workforce, the 20-somethings. In the middle, you see that cliff down there. That's the 30-something Gen X generation. The big boom on the right, that's the baby boom. You can see it. That's why they call it baby boom. There's 78 million baby boomers. There's 48 million Gen Xers. Baby boomers leaving, right? Half a person to take the place of every baby boomer that's leaving. Let's think about what that means for succession planning, development of your high potentials, 
knowledge transfer. You know, we still haven't figured out the Vulcan mind meld. I mean, no matter where trans, you know, t uh, technology goes, we still haven't figured that out. So we still have to actually share knowledge. So, so this one slide, I could speak a half a day about, um, but this is kind of like a, what I first recognized when Mitchell Fromstein was the CEO, the late Mitchell Fromstein. He was the CEO of Manpower at a time. In 1990, the very bottom of that kind of chart peak was when the shortage of the entrance to the workforce was in their 20s, right? That was 1990. And Doug Copeland first coined this phrase, Generation X. X standing for the unknown, like in an algebraic equation, or Malcolm X's last name is this unknown slave name was Malcolm X. So Generation X, what meant was there's a whole different generation with different work attitudes, and, and it's largely unknown, but it's different clearly than the baby boomers. Anyway, he was in a room like this, like 200, 300 people, mostly HR people, and they were like, oh, there's a war for talent, there's a war for talent. By the way, it's not a war on talent. It's a war for talent, so let's correct that wherever we see it. Nobody's saying we're against talent, but there's a war for talent. And Mitchell Fromstein stood up there and he goes, you know what, you guys, you ought to know better than this shame on you. I'm gonna tell you a simple formula that you're gonna keep in mind. It takes 20 years to make a 20-year-old. <laughs> oh, that's good. I'm going to write that down. I don't remember that, right? So all you had to do was pay attention to birth records to figure out this was coming. You should have known about it. You should have been preparing for it. You know, you're sitting here going, what are we going to do? And, and it's not going to change. These are birth records, right? So understand this. This is the foundation of what we're working with today. So if you look at that and say, boy, I can figure out a lot of things. One of them is, did you know 10,000 people turn 65 every day for the next 15 years? Oh, today, 10,000 more. Tomorrow, 10,000 more. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day. In 15 years, you'll be at Rotary meetings going, I remember what Debbie Seeger said then, and it's finally over. But man, that's a lot of knowledge walking out the door, isn't it? We have never seen anything like that before in the history of our country. If you took out all the knowledge and wisdom of all the people over 50 out of the world, there wouldn't be enough left to run it. You know, but then luckily we've got this big generation coming behind them, their kids on the far left there, you know, boomers had a bunch of kids, right? And so, you know, they're bringing the uberization to the economy, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, how about secession planning? In, you know, to prepare for the fact that for every one that's leaving, there's half a person left to take their job. Productivity is going to have to improve. Technology is going to be part of that. Um, and then how about at that peak, if you look at the peak of the baby boomer group there, if you're selling anything to those people, that that's your target market audience? Tempur-Pedic mattresses, <laughs> Harley Davidsons, right? Uh, American Girl, right? Let's talk Madison. Uh, they, they all, all those baby boomers, they bought dolls for their kids. Now who's next to buy your stuff? Boy, you got to be looking outside of the U.S. There's 30 million fewer people coming behind the baby boomers to buy your stuff. We consult with clients every day on this issue. It's not going to change. And so with this, we've got to think differently about all kinds of things like immigration and, you know, just the way work gets done. Is it making sense? Yeah. Here's the other thing that I thought was really interesting, and I saw this in the uh, 1970s. Morris Massey wrote a book called What You Are Now is What You Were When. And if you can't see it, don't worry, I'll explain it. But it's kind of like a timeline of your life from 0 to 20 and what's happening. Morris Massey, by the way, did a video of this. Do not look at it, because you'll not pay attention to anything he says when you are blinded by the white sands belt, you know, shoes and patent leather, and it's 70s were not a good time. Um, <laughs> but he was brilliant in the way that he understood something about the way people develop. And you've heard this about baby chicks. They come out of their shell and they imprint, right? They imprint on what's immediately around them. Well, what happens when kids zero to 10 is they're imprinting. They're taking in from everything around them, their church, their community, their neighborhood, their home, their elders. And what's going on in their life at that time is really impressionable, right? And then 
from 10 to 20, they start modeling some behaviors that they start to feel like from the imprinting, this feels like this resonates with me and who I am as a person, how I'm developing my own values and morals and ethics. And so if you think about that and think about where you were in your modeling years and what was going on, baby boomers, we all know where we were the day we found out that JFK was shot. We know where we were. We know where we were when we were watching on television the news about the Kent State shooting. It was shocking to us because we were students. And it changed us in a way that stayed with us and helped form our core. Think about Gen X. They remember where they were in the classroom all around the television watching that space shuttle go up into the air with the teacher on board and explode right in front of their eyes. They don't, though, have the framework that we had with our JFK Kent State experience. So we can't have the same framework. They have a different one. And so it's different, and therefore, we're built differently. We're wired differently. You think about the kids who are in that 10 to 20, and they're modeling who they think they are. When do kids usually start experiment with smoking and things like that? I remember when my daughter was in middle school, and she'd come downstairs for breakfast every morning, and every day it was like, wow, look at you. <laughs> Man, you know, I had the, not the heart to tell her that what she was modeling probably didn't look like what we were hoping, you know, to, to go back upstairs. And yeah, I know I shouldn't have bought it for you in the first place if I didn't want you to wear it to school, but I, I think you need to do a do-over today, right? They're modeling who they are. Now think about this and why the number of school shootings that are perpetrated by young men in this age group. Because somehow they have modeled who they think they are to their world and it got rejected. And not just bullied, but rejected. And, and kids who feel rejected, that they have no worth, are acting out in a way, and, and truly there's some mental health issues here, but when a person is rejected and they're acting out in a way at this critical time in their development, it can be disastrous. According to Morris Massey's theory, by the time you're 20, you're a grown ass person. It's a technical term for it, but you're kind of pretty, you know, pretty well set. You know, you've formed yourself and your ideals and your morals and your ethics, and he says they are not likely to change after age 20. So if we think about the workforce and the time that we have to shape the skills, knowledge, abilities, and personal characteristics of a workforce. I hear too many employers say, well, these kids come in and they don't have critical thinking. They don't have a work ethic. They don't show initiative. And I think, well, that's an interesting problem. What are you going to do about it, right? Influence is so important still at this very, if we can still capture some influence at this stage. And my dad wasn't a tall person. And God bless me, he had four girls five foot two, but a giant of a man. And he'd walk around in our house with four girls, crazy house, and we'd go, Dad, where are you going? He'd go, forward. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember he used to say to me sometimes, he'd say, you know what, Dub, I can't make you do anything, but I can make you wish you did. <laughs> I wasn't a woman of influence. I was a woman who got stuff done, and that's why you know I got that award. But I understand influence because, gosh darn it, I never wanted to come home and have to tell my dad that the name he gave me to go out to the world with, the one he gave me that was in good condition when he gave it to me, that I ruined somehow, right? Did not ever want to have to do that. My dad had influence. He was the first guy to get to work and he was always so early, he would be shoveling their driveway before anybody else got there. I mean, you know, that's a work ethic. So think about that in the kids who don't grow up around an environment where there's family and leadership around them modeling that skill. Where do you get a work ethic? You get it that way. How do you teach a work ethic? Man, I could have a gajillion dollars if I'd figure that out, right? And so it's, it's all of our jobs. And then, they don't stay, right? People just don't stay in jobs as much as they used to. 
Why? Well, we went through the 80s, a period of layoffs, you know, and my dad worked for American Motors, and I know that when he was investing in his pension all those years, he wasn't financially savvy, made $25,000 a year at his peak, saved, you know, with a family of five kids, saved his money as best he could, and he trusted in the pension they promised him he would have. And I remember where I was the day with him when he learned that his pension had been defunded. He'd already retired, he had no more chance to make any more money. His pension had been defunded. There was a promise that he was made. And the people who were the stewards of that promise just didn't do the math and they didn't figure out how to make this work. And so for the baby boomers and the people before us, our parents who created Social Security, let me tell you, some of you know this, Social Security was enacted specifically to take care of the oldest 2% of our population who is too elderly or infirm to take care of themselves. It was not meant to be a retirement plan. But at that time in our history, the oldest 2% of our population was 65 or over. And if the people who had created that program had just done the math and the actuarials to keep up with the intention of Social Security, you wouldn't be eligible for it today until you're 84. That's the truth of it. And those are the people who should get it. So now we have this big problem that the baby boomers all kind of came into and went, well, I paid into it, I want to take out of it, right? So we're going to leave this problem now to the millennials to fix. We, we all have to come together and kind of look at what are the trends of the problems we fix. I'll tell you another big problem that I'm hoping is going to get fixed with health care reform. So I had two kids, so half this room knows maybe if, what that's like. Uh, and I remember going into the hospital with my husband at the side of the gurney going, you know what, honey, um, if you could hang on till midnight, you could stay over tomorrow and the insurance will cover it. And I grabbed him by his collar. <laughs> I said, you know what, honey, you pull your top lip over your head and then you try to say that to me again. <laughs> What the hell are we doing? We're sending people home after they give birth after 24 hours? Are, are we crazy? We gotta fix this. So back to people not staying in jobs very long. The covenant of the employer-employer relationship, it goes back and forth. You know why? Because shift happens. And right now we ought to look at if you're gonna be the employer of choice, what is gonna make you the employer of choice when there's a shrinking number of Gen Xers coming into leadership, right? They're gonna be in the demand seat on that relationship side. It's not a war on talent, it's a war for talent. You're all gonna be washing each other's socks, okay? And so an investment that you make in somebody, in their development, is an investment that you make in our future. 83% of Japanese companies have retention strategies in place. The U.S. is 21%. People work for one of two reasons, emotional compensation and financial compensation. The financial compensation, that's we got bills to pay, right? Otherwise, why do we work? If you don't need financial compensation and you still work, it's called volunteering, okay? You volunteer for emotional compensation. And those are the only two levers that you have as businesses. So. This is the part where I say, here's about what you do about it in Madison, Wisconsin. As business owners know, you have two levers, financial compensation and emotional compensation. And if you're not a big company and you don't have a lot of money to throw at the talent problem, here's what you have as your secret weapon. You amp up your emotional compensation. The companies that do better coming out of the recession are the companies that worked really hard to understand how to treat their employees like family, how to treat them like grown ass people and give them you know, the hard news of what was going on. Let the companies decide if it was better for everybody to take a haircut and pay or for us to have layoffs or furloughs. Most of those companies when the employers were involved voted for everybody to take a little bit on time off instead of somebody to lose their job. Most of those companies are the ones that have more success coming out of the recession. That emotional compensation, if you are very highly paid but don't feel valued at all, you'll leave. If you feel fairly paid and fairly valued, you'll stay. If you feel highly valued and at least fairly paid, you'll stay. But boy, both of those drop, you're gone. Somebody else is gonna pick you up, somebody down the street. But I know a company, 
They're very competitive manufacturing. They're all, again, washing each other's socks, trying to attract the new entrants to the workforce. And they said, let's invest in this Hmong population that we have of employees here by teaching English as a second language. What a great idea, right? Now we're investing in them and their ability to improve their lives and their livelihood. And then they said, heck, we're already paying these teachers to come. Why don't we let them open it up to their spouses and their kids and their neighbors? Boy, amping up the emotional compensation. Isn't that so smart? And, and it doesn't cost a thing. It's the favorite part of this conversation, the CFO. Those CFOs say, you know, what do we spend all this money to train employees just so that they leave? And the CEOs are the, you know, big picture strategy people are usually saying, yeah, well, what if we don't spend any money on these day? <laughs> <laughs> this is the part where if there's not time for questions and answers later, that's okay because I'll stay after, but I thought I'd at least give you something to take away here. I said I wasn't going to tell you everything, but I was going to help you think differently about it, right? Um, but the last thing I want to be up here is taking your questions and like be stumped on camera. So <laughs> who would want that? But seriously, if there's time, we will. Um, but so what can you do? First of all, align in your recruitment, development, retention, your brand. GE said if we put our vision and mission statement out there to people and say these are the things we stand for, we should uphold those things we stand for so strong that any employee who does not share those expressed values would do better to select themselves out of the organization. It's a pretty strong statement. And they're kind of saying, don't pee in our pool. Right? This is who we are. If you're not part of this, and there's room for plenty of diverse thinking and all those kinds of things, but the rules you don't break are the value rules. And if you're not one of us, you probably won't do well here. So first of all, figure out who you are as a company. What is that brand? What do you stand for? And then how do you articulate that so people that are out there looking for somebody who stands something would find and attract to that emotional compensation? One of the first rules that we instituted in starting our company together, Mike Harris and I, Patina, and this is the name of a book, so I don't think I'm just getting away with you know some gratuitous swearing, but the name of the book is The No Asshole Rule. You know this book? By Dr. Bob Sutton, right? And what I love about it is Mike and I thought if neither one of us are one, we could just not hire any and have a whole company of none. Wouldn't that be great? So then we had to develop our asshole filter. So we didn't, we didn't hire any. So every talent director in our company literally reads this book and develops their filter. And what Dr. Bob Sutton says in his book is there's two kinds of those people. There's temporary assholes. You know, every one of us can do something kind of temporary, not cool, right? Say, oh, yeah, I probably could have handled that differently. Not, but not intentionally to diminish somebody or demean them or make them feel bad. And then there's the certified assholes. <laughs> and he says, those are the ones that you can't change. I used to tell my kids, you cannot talk yourself out of something you behaved your way into. Right? So parents, you're getting a bunch of freebies today. I made every mistake. Uh, but really, you got to behave your way out of this, right? And, and how about all the young people that are working with us? And they're like, technical manuals? That industry is going nowhere because nobody ever reads the technical manual. They just want to go, well, you know, figure, you, you read it, I'll figure this out. God bless them. That's a skill. You know, they could be opening a present on Christmas morning and have it all set up and by I'm on page two on the technical manual still. I'm still on hold with customer service and they're figuring it out, right? And so if we say as a value in our company, this is who we are, and we're not going to let any of the certified folks in. That's who we are, right? And that's going to attract a certain level of person. Now align that then in the way you interview and in the way you behave. Because people will sniff it out if the way you say you act and the way you actually behave are different. What else can you feel? What's the gap in knowledge and, and the bandwidth that you get from the current state to the future state? So what are we going to have to be hiring for? This whole idea of what got you here won't get you there. I mean, more business leaders have to get involved in this process of your future workforce because it's your greatest asset. And if you still think that relegating this to your HR department is something that's smart, somebody else will be eating out of your lunchbox. I guarantee it, right? Because again, we're washing each other's socks. 
on the movement of talent. Uh, establish leadership expectations and begin with a focus on trust. I found out that Donna Brazil and Mary Matlin, opposite sides of the spectrum politically, but they're best friends. And I thought, how is that possible? You know, I can't even sit at dinner with some of my friends when we talk politics. And what I learned in the interview of these two women is that they spent so much time in the campaign trail together. What they found out was they both at their core wanted the same thing. They just didn't agree on what to do about it. But if they have conflict, they could at least have it built on trust that at their core, they wanted the same thing. And I would submit to you in your businesses not to try to avoid conflict because I'll go back to Albert Einstein who said anytime you get two diverse things coming together, you create a spark, that could be conflict. And that's okay. Conflict is okay. You can work through it though if you have built a foundation of trust that you all want the same thing. Then we just have to figure out what is the best thing to do about this. So that story to me was really powerful to recognize that. Um, for some people, again, each of the generations are different. It's no longer about work-life balance. It's all life to them. They don't turn off their phones. They take their phones to bed with them, right? And so they can't just shut it off. And they can't, on um, these poor people, where is this going? Let's be futurist a little bit. They can't get off the grid. They can't take a vacation. You know, we, we've kind of beat it into them that they should be on 24-7 because we've got these devices and those poor people, they're the ones who should be really pushing back a little bit and saying, no, I got to get off the grid. People need time to reduce and regenerate and, and get away and do their best thinking. And so we've done a disservice to a group of any employees who think that they really can't ever get away from the job. Um, but they also recognize it's all part of life and that's why you see more dogs in the workplace. Um, Help them see the path to the future. You know, their world is changing so fast. Again, technology is changing so fast. What's the path? Let me see the future. And I'll never forget this when I uh, had my son was looking at, uh, we always watched the movie The Wizard of Oz. And I, I grew up at a time when we saw that once a year. It was on one of the three channels. And if it was on, you watched it or you missed it, right? And then, you know, fast forward to the days when you can get any movie on demand you want. So. He was watching a loop of The Wizard of Oz. And finally, he was getting so frustrated. And I was like, what's the matter? Why are you so frustrated? He goes, well, that Glenda, she knew the whole time that Dorothy just had to tap her heels three times. She knew the whole time. Why didn't she tell her? <laughs> Why did she make her go through the poppies and the flying monkeys? And it? Why didn't she just tell her? You know, that's that whole, you know, technical plan. You'll forget that. Let me just, what's the answer? Right? Shortcut it for me. There are some things, though, that they can't Google their way out of. And so they need the critical thinking, and, and they have to have the experience, right? And we were just talking here about how our kids in every generation wants it better for your kids than it was for you. And now we got into the point where it's so much better that, you know, man, our kids, I want them to know hard work without knowing hardship. I don't know if it's possible, though. I know that my great grandpa Giuseppe in the Italy of Capo Malazzo, Sicily, I know that he was saying to my grandpa on the day he got on the boat, right? Because everybody came on the boat. <laughs> and he was probably looking at him, you know, like, you want to go to America where it's easier there for a nicer life? It's really tough in this rocky terrain here. And he probably said something like, go, go to your fancy America, you fancy boy. So lazy, you slacker. <laughs> right? He probably said something like that. And, and we called a bunch of other kids after us the same slackers. You know, you slackers, you want it so easy. I had to walk to school with no boots and it's hard. Uh, and yet our kids have to have the experiences themselves because if we fix all their problems for them, we're robbing them of their ability to develop critical thinking. We're robbing them of their confidence to think through these things. And so all of our jobs, right, to help this workforce. Assign a mentor. Again, that helps them on seeing the path. The Price Waterhouse study said 98% of millennials report having a mentor as being more important than having more pay. Wow, emotional compensation, right? If you didn't think it was possible that there's something more important than pay. 
Um, it's why we're rolling out the Mentor Bank program at Patina. We've got 13,000 people registered with us to bring expertise to our clients, and they could enter into mentoring relationships. And we're not going to make that match, by the way, because why? Millennials, they want to find their own match. The Uberization of the economy is, let, just let me find my own. It's like dating services, right? You know, call me. Um, but, so. And identify the mix of compensation strategies that'll help you be the employer of choice, both on the financial and emotional. So that's what Madison businesses can be thinking about. All right, this is interesting. Uh, and hopefully all of you can see this. It's just gonna take a few minutes here as we're kind of wrapping up to see if you can read this sentence so quickly a number of times so that you could possibly memorize it to see, is it possible? to memorize this sentence. And while you're doing that, there's nobody at the piano. Anybody watch Jimmy Fallon and the thank you note music, you know? Um, so just think about that. I'm gonna take a drink of water, I'll be right back. And it looks like we will have time for questions, so I'll play, you know, stump the speaker. Okay. Stand up if you see at least three F's in the sentence, if you can. Stand up if you see three F's, F's in the sentence, at least three. Stay standing if you see four. I will call on you <laughs> to find me the four F's in the sentence. Stay standing if you see more than four. And you can tell me there are more than four F's in this sentence. Stay standing if you can tell me that there are more. All right, what just happened? What happened? Some of you see more than four and some of you don't. What happened? The ofs. Oh. <laughs> oh I didn't hide them from you. They're right there. Yeah. <laughs> They're right there, right in front of your eyes. I did not hide them from you. This is not a trick. But what happened? The brain did something. Here's what happens. When you learn how to read, you're generally learning how to read with somebody sitting next to you, helping you smooth out the cadence of the way you're saying the words, right? And you're sounding them out, and over time you build your competency about reading, and you cross over some words, and your brain tells you, in order to keep the cadence, Every time you get to that word O-F, it makes a V sound, it's not really an F. And so your brain now hid it from you in order to allow you to read faster. Brain, tricky thing, right? Did that to you. You didn't even know it did that to you. And so why I like this exercise is because it reminds us that there are things that are right in front of us that we're looking at and we're seeing them a certain way and we forgot that sometime in, you know, in our development, we've trained ourselves to stop even seeing it for what it is. And ask yourselves when you're going into those situations, if you're really seeing things with a fresh openness, or do you have your baby boomer prism or your Xer prism on it? And to ask yourself, if a young person looked at this, how would they see it? Or just ask young people, how do you see it? I guarantee you, you ask somebody who's in second grade, how many Fs are, they'll point them all out, right? Wow, that was so profound, we're stunned into silence. <laughs> okay, all right, so the good news is we are at the part of the program where we've got a little bit of time for any questions. Uh, people leaving, D just, uh, was I right? Was it best for last, right? All right, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, glad you get to see that, okay. Mike's over here. <coughs> thank you so much for coming. Um, a point of information for all the Rotarians, we're being videotaped. And oh, you can, man. And you can watch this on our website and the slides will be included. So if you were trying to write quickly, and what I want to thank you so much for is opening our eyes to changing workforce demands. 
Um, as a part of our club's race to equity, we're looking at including diversity within our workforces. Can you please speak to the incredible value a diverse workforce brings, brings to a company? Thank you. Well, so the question is, can I speak to the incredible value a diverse workforce brings? And if it's not already obvious, right, it takes all kinds. My grandma used to say, I don't know why it does, but it does. It takes all kinds. Um, we can see from these exercises that we are set in our own way of thinking with our own prism, ours that's been shaped by our environment. We will not have the benefit of all the thinking if we don't introduce ourselves to other people who came up with different sets of zero to 10 experiences, different sets of 10 to 20 experiences, right? What was going on in their life to help us think differently. It will take the benefit of all of our collective thinking to solve some of the problems that we have with our healthcare system, social security, where we are as a world economy, how we can continue to compete, what should we do about immigration? And so if we don't have all of the thinking in the room, you know, we'll just be making the same mistakes that we made over and over again because we haven't broadened our horizons. I would say four generations in the workforce. Diversity can come in age, gender, race, right? And so thinking differently. Diversity can come with getting IT people in a room with HR people. Oh my God, you know, whoo, watch that happen. <laughs> and so the diversity of thinking can be thought of a lot of different ways. It could also be think of reverse mentoring. You know, there's a number of 20-somethings that could do a really great job to help some of your senior leaders in business learn more about social media. I mean, I don't know if you tried to do Twitter, but Man, I tweeted four times and I have, I don't know, 100 some followers. I'm like, who are you people? Uh, and so just the idea of social media and how readily they adapt to it, that's diversity. And so I would say we need it all. And if you go back to your work environment and say just we all seem to, I mean, we attract people that we know, right? And so it's going to be our network of people that we generally are attracted to. And so ask yourself where you're not even allowing your company to, to reach a broader audience of people that might bring some great diversity thinking to your business. If you're seeing your recruitment strategy as if they were Fs and they really sound like Vs, it's time to think differently and examine it. Make sense? Uh, these days I've been watching in the paper almost every day there's a robot uh, mention of some sort. Uh, robots are going to take care of all the clerical jobs and they've already gotten all the elevator operators to be robots and there's going to be a big transformation in technology there. Um, maybe we don't need, you know, maybe all those people that you think we can't hire, maybe they're never going to get hired. What do you think about robots? Well, there's the thing about robot, you can program it not to be an asshole, right? <laughs> <laughs> really, I mean, uh, just don't be a dick. That's kind of the point of that is, uh, so with a robot, you can program and there, there are avatar robots taking clinical information into healthcare environments who can get programmed to emote, uh, don't know how they do that. There are driverless cars in five years, anybody who's selling auto insurance, figure it out, right? Uh, every company we're in is being disrupted by technology. Um, and I, you know, I used to have, I would call them healthy debates with Mitchell Framstein, the former CEO of Manpower. He'd call them arguments. And I thought, man, I thought this was healthy debate. And, and I, he'd say, you know what, um, um, and I, I've had this a lot in my career where, where sometimes I felt like men want to diminish women and they would say, you're so emotional. Right? And that felt like, whoa, you know, if you wanted emotionless workers, go to Russia. Okay. And, um, nothing against Russian people, but they're kind of steadfast and serious in, in their work at the time. And so we are emotional. This is personal. And I don't know what it's going to be like when things are less personal, but I do think there are some things that should be done with less emotion and a more clinical view of it that's based in real data and not emotion. I hope that we find that we employ that in the right place in business. Uh, because, you know, to anybody who's done online dating know that people can lie about who they are. Um, and so, um, it's an interesting world we live in, and I think if we embrace the right 
place for robotics. It's coming, you know, whether you like it or not. And let's just decide where we need the humanness of it. But what scares me even more is, again, the loss of the phone call, the loss of the personal interaction, the way a young generation of kids, they just text each other. They don't even pick up the phone. When there's a crucial conversation, and that means something that you have to lay eyeballs on, how does that happen with the whole generation of kids who are just used to texting and emojis? Will, will they text like right in front of each other? You know, I, 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 I don't know. And I'll say for that, I don't have the answers, but hopefully if I've sparked some ability of you to think about that. We just made an executive's decision. We are going to abandon the program that texts you that the meeting is adjourned.